Uh, okay. God, I have so much respect for YouTubers and people who upload videos. It's, they, they make it look so easy. Okay, so let's um, let's revisit. We were in the middle of something. Um, yeah. So right, we were trying to prove a different theorem that I guess I'll um, when we'll, the next thing we'll do is to prove that theorem. So I'll come back to the statement of that in a second. But this is what we were we got about it. The proof is about two pages, two handwritten pages, and we 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 got through almost the, about a page of it, as I recall. So okay. So G is a finite P group, and A is very simple, it's very, very restrictive. It's a, it's a P torsion uh, G module, which if you think about it for a second, is the same as being a FP of G module. And so in this case, um, one vanishing Tate cohomology group is going to um, imply kind of everything we could ever want. So as long as this thing has one vanishing Tate cohomology group, it's just the best kind of module in the world, uh, best kind of p-torsion G module in the world, namely a free FP of G module. And again, we had our discussion about induced modules, anything of the form X bracket G, which means ZG tensor X um, for any commutative group X, those are precisely the induced modules. So this so FP bracket uh, G, um, or you know any any uh, group ring here R bracket G would would, would be an induced um, would be an induced ZG module, and then again we proved pretty easily um, that uh, induced G modules were um, cohomologically trivial. Like I think that's probably was probably relying on exactly the thing that Ion just just proved for us. Okay, so yeah, so it certainly is enough to prove that a P torsion G, again, G is a, a lot of P's here. Everything is, everything is localized to P in the strongest possible sense. G is a finite P group. A is a P torsion G module. And then one vanishing tape homology group gives you that it's free. Okay. And so we introduced this little dimension shifting formalism. So um, again, we can canonically embed every G module in the world into a co-induced G module. We did that, we reviewed the formula last time. We can canonically realize every G module as a quotient of an induced G module. And then the point being that um, the, the point being that it's, it's sort of natural to take the co-kernel of this injection and it's natural to take the kernel of this surjection. And because the thing in the middle is induced, which is the same as co-induced uh, for finite groups, hence cohomologically trivial, if you take the long exact sequence in Tate cohomology, then the Tate cohomology of M is basically going to be equal to the Tate cohomology of the, uh, the co-kernel of iota, but with a shift in the indices, right? That's what happens. And then similarly, the Tate cohomology of M is basically going to be the same as the Tate cohomology of the kernel of this quotient map Q, but with a shift in the indices, okay. And so then we generalize this a little bit, you A1 to be the co-kernel, and then you keep doing that if you want. So if you can shift indices however you like, A minus one is the kernel of Q, and then keep doing that. Um, okay, and then again, this shifting process, among other things, if you start with a P torsion module, you immediately you know, you stop and you look at what the definitions are, and you just, just, by, just by looking at the definitions, you can see that all of your shifted G modules are also going to be P torsion. Okay, and then again, the, the most important property, as, as I was alluding to before, is that um, this gives you kind of, um, you know, you, you can shift your Tate cohomology however the heck you want. You, know, you can make, you know, if you're like, oh, I, 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 I just want to see a different index on my Tate cohomology group. Well, you can. Every Tate cohomology for whatever index you want is a Tate cohomology of some other index. Um, any other index that you want for the same group with a with a twisted twisted module. Okay, so right, and so what was this? This is a review, although I guess we did it kind of quickly uh, at the end last time. I think we got up to here. So let's let's. I am sure it will make most sense if we just look at it again. 
so yeah, so our goal is to construct, well, we want to construct a free FPG module that's isomorphic to A. That's, that's what it means to show that, that A is free as an FPG module. So the first step is we construct a free FPG G module so that its invariants are isomorphic to the G invariants. Okay. And then the second step is we kind of ex we, we show that that isomorphism on the G invariants uh, extends to an isomorphism from all of V to all of them. Okay, what is our candidate V? Um, it's this guy. So it's this again, this, this induced module um, uh, construction here. Uh, right. And let's see, I guess I had some discussion last time as to why this thing was actually a free uh, FP of G module. Did I? I don't know. It's not, it's not, it's not so hard to see again. So AG is, um, is just a, it's just an FP vector space. So it's a free FP module. So in fact, AG is just the direct sum of copies of FP. And so therefore, this direct sum of copies of FP bracket G is the direct sum of a bunch of copies of FP of G. So if you just distribute the direct sum through the bracket, then you do get that this thing is isomorphic to a direct sum of a certain number of copies of FP of G, which for the second time in 10 minutes is of course what it means to be a free module. Okay, so let's see. Um, Right, and so I as I reviewed last time, which was a generalization of this homework exercise, um, if you take any induced module over a finite group X, you know, so ZG tensor X, then the G invariants are canonically isomorphic to X viewed as the constant functions, um, the ones where the, um, for all little G and G, X of G is formal, finite, formal sums, which are necessarily finite since G is finite over the elements of x. And so the constant ones are the ones where for each little g and g, xg is the same. And again, that's generalizing this exercise that Tyler solved, which was that if you just take x equals z, then um, the invariants are the, um, the cyclic subgroup generated by the normal. OK, let's see. Now we go on. So I'm going to take an fp hum. And again, I, instead of an FP hum, I could just take a Z hum because everything in sight is, um, I mean, again, what is, a, what is an FP module other than a Z module um, on which PX is zero? So again, let's still do the same thing. And so I could, I could say FP hum or I could say, I can say Z hum as long as, as long as I'm sticking FP modules here. Okay, so that's an exact functor because FP is a field. And so if I apply this exact, in general, hum blank of a module would be exact if and only if that module is injective, if I remember correctly. Uh, but we're revealed, so everything is projective, everything is injective, that's fine. So we apply the hum to this um, exact sequence. This is, a, this is the type of hum that gives you a contravariant functor. Okay, so it's contravariant and the exact sequence is preserved. All right. Um, Da, 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 da. So by some earlier lemma, hum of any G module into an induced module is also induced. And I already blathered on about how I can, I can put the FP in here. I could take it out. It's, it's the same thing. So therefore, this M, which is this hum from A mod AG into V, so in other words, just the first term in this exact sequence, is induced. Therefore, it's cohomologically trivial. Um, again, we talk, talked about that. That's easy. Um, and in particular, well, lots of cohomology, basically every cohomology group in sight uh, when you apply to M is zero. That's what cohomologically trivial means. So the first G cohomology of M is, is trivial. Well, that's helpful if I were going to take the long exact cohomology sequence here. So I do this. Um, what am I doing? I take, I take the G invariants here. And so the G invariants of a HOM for like the fifth time are the G equivariant maps. Okay, so I took that there. Similarly here, I got the G invariants and again, HOM, um, these, these two things are easily seen to be, to be equal to each other. Okay, and again, the next term in the long, there's a co-boundary connecting homomorphism here. And the next term would be H1G with coefficients in this guy, but I just said that that's zero. 
So therefore, when I take G invariants, the, the surge activity is, is routine. Okay. This is where we stopped, basically. So what does that mean? Well, it means that, um, right. So I'm taking a map from A to V, and I, this map is, is taking my map from A to V and restricting it to AG, in which case it must land in, in VG because it's, because it's G invariant. And we just proved using the long exact homology sequence that this restriction map is surjective. Okay, well, we know that AG is isomorphic or equal to, we've, can, we have some map that, that identifies AG and VG. So we have like an identity element in here, which is making these things um, isomorphic. And since this map is surjective, then indeed there must be some map A from, you know, that this is a surjection. So let, let, let J be the G hum that uh, between A and V that restricts to give the isomorphism from AG onto VG. Okay, that's where we stopped last time. Any, any questions about that before we move on? I mean, this is sort of a nice proof, right? Like we're trying to show that um, we're trying to show that V is isomorphic to A. We cooked up a V that it was super clear that VG was isomorphic to AG. How did we, you know, like are we going to, you know, how are we going to extend that map? Well, the magic of homological algebra gave us gave us an extension of this map. The next thing, of course, the last thing is to check that this extended map is actually an isomorphism. Well, gosh, let's look at its kernel. Let's look at its co-kernel. Let's show that both of those are zero. So I actually really like this argument because I think it's just applying um, a lot of kind of um, standard useful techniques in um, homological algebra and group homology. Okay. We haven't seen the, 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 the twisting yet, so that, that should come in at some point. Okay, so we apply the left, the invariants are as ever a, a left exact functor, right? It's like the first thing we did in the course, I guess. Um, and so here's a, you know, a left exact sequence, if you are, um, not a left exact sequence, uh, whatever, an exact sequence that is, that is of, this, of this form, right? So just the kernel sequence. And so since by definition of, a, of left exact, this type of exact sequence will remain exact after you apply the functor. Okay, so we get this. Okay, so we have this type of exact sequence. This thing injects, this is an isomorphism. So again, if you're just, just working with exact sequences, um, that implies that this, you know, if, some, if you have a map, if you have a map here and the next map is an isomorphism, then the exactness means that this map is zero. Um, and it's injection. So um, if the zero map is an injection, then that means that the thing is zero. So we wanted to prove that the kernel of J was zero. We proved that the G invariants of the kernel were zero. Gosh, it would really be cool if whenever the G invariants being zero implied that the whole module was equal to zero. Well, it is cool and we have a result like that. Not in full generality, but in fact, in more generality that we need. Whenever you have a finite P group, which is exactly what we have, acting on a P primary torsion Z module, we have something better than this. We actually have a P torsion Z module, so fine. And then again, you know, if if the G invariants are zero, then the whole the whole module is zero. Okay. So things are coming together. Uh, and so we get that the, the kernel is zero. And so now our map J from A to V is injective. We want to prove it's surjective. Well, gosh, let's look at the co-kernel, right? But this can't go, I mean, the argument cannot be the same as before. Why not? Why am I not just going to, why can I not just write down the exact same argument for the co-kernel that I did for the kernel? Because the functor is not right exact, right? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly, right, exactly, yeah. Anyway, so right, that, that's the point. You know, the the, the the functor was left exact. It's not right exact, so we better we better work harder. So, well, what's the point? Well, the point is, you know, I can't put zero here by by the miracle of homological algebra. What I can put here is the next is the cohomology group, right? So now I better look at this, right? And you say like, you know, okay, what do I what do I know about H1 of G? 
I don't know. And now, now in fact, maybe it's like, wh where are we going with this? If you look back, we might have gotten a little bit lost. So let's look back at the statement. And you see something interesting is happening here. There, there's a hypothesis that we just haven't used yet, by the way. So if you're like, wait, what do I do now? Well, probably you should use the hypothesis that you haven't touched and that the result is not true without. So what, what have we not worked into the picture at all in the statement of this theorem? Some cohomology group is zero. Yeah, exactly. Now, obviously, this result is not going to be true if you don't say something with, without this hypothesis. And so, okay, our next goal is to figure out how to make use of this one that the fact that one of the Tate cohomology groups is vanishing. And now, if I do say so myself, I think I'm explaining it pretty well because um, because we would like this thing to be zero. Right. If this thing is zero, then it is the same as before. Right. Then, um, uh, if this thing, if if this thing is zero, then we have um, what is what is happening here? Then we have an ex then we actually do have a short exact sequence. This thing is a is an isomorphism, so this thing would therefore have to be uh, would therefore have to be the zero map. And if if if, if that's surjective. Then that um, that forces this thing to be zero, right? So we would love if 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 only h one of g a were actually equal to zero, then then we could make the same argument and be done. And that's that's not what we have. We have some other tape cohomology group, uh, some other index of in, some other index tape cohomology group is equal to zero. So we should probably dimension shift, right? So that the the end of the proof, right? If h one g a is equal to zero then the exactness of the, of the sequence here and the fact that this is an isomorphism exactly the same as before gives that the g invariance of the um of the co-kernel is zero and again by the same lemma if uh because we have a finite p group acting on a p primary torsion module if the g invariance is zero the whole thing is zero and then um and then we would get that it's an isomorphism okay and um now, I guess here is where I decide for some reason I write I wrote down well not for some reason I verbally I was explaining why uh, why a g bracket g is a free FP module so this is just what I was what I was saying in words in words before okay so we're all good if if h one of g a is equal to zero that's not exactly what we've assumed we've assumed a different index one is equal to zero so now comes the dimension shifting right. So by assumption, there's some Q so that that's equal to zero, right? Um, and now we do the dimension shifting. So uh, this is this is exactly what I mean. Let's let me go back and show you. Right. So this is the way the shifting works. You know, you the the one way to think about this is a zero, and the sum of this Q and this and this R should be equal to the sum of this Q and this R. That's the way the bookkeeping works. And so, um, you know, I can, if I decrease this index by R, I have to increase that one by R. So we come in here and we say, um, let's, let's shift down to an H1, okay? So I decrease, I subtract Q minus one on the cohomology index, so I better shift up here by Q minus one, okay? And then I say, Oh gosh, well now the entire argument that I just made does apply not to A, but to this Q minus one shifty thing in terms of A. Everything, I mean, you know, the hypothesis were pretty, um, the argument just works. The only thing that we're using is that, is that all the, sh the, the shifts of A are still P torsion G modules, which is certainly true. And so now we apply, um, now we apply the, the argument that we just made to a sub q minus one in place of a. And what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that a sub q minus one has this wonderful property of being free as an FP of G module. Therefore, it's induced. Okay. And induced modules are acyclic for Tate homology. That's our previous, previous result, right? Um, yeah. 
And so what's the idea is, well, that, well, now that we know that AQ minus one is acyclic for Tate cohomology, we can probably shift back down. So now we, now we do a, a reverse dimension shift, right? So the H1 that we wanted to be equal to zero of A, we can now, again, just make sure the indices add up. This is a, there's nothing here, so that's a zero. One plus zero is one. Two minus Q plus Q minus one is two minus one is one. That was a good shift, okay? But again, AQ minus one is totally acyclic for Tate cohomology. So whatever index this is, is equal to zero. So, hey, we did get that H1 of G of A is equal to zero. That's what we wanted to see. And that completes the proof. This is a nice proof, I, I think. I really, I really think, um, yeah, so this, this is a good application. It's certainly a very nice application of the concept of dimension shifting. And uh, yeah, so I, think, I think when I got to this point in the reading, I was like, oh, I like this. I want to present this in, in full detail. So it's a nice argument. OK, um, maybe I'll go, I'll, I'll go for a bit longer. We'll see, not, not forever. But now is when I go back and remind you that the big theorem that I really wanted to prove was this mouthful of a theorem. Okay. So I have a finite group. I have a G module. Suppose that um, prime by prime, there's a CELO P subgroup of G and two consecutive indices for which the Tate cohomology restricted to that CELO P subgroup of A is equal to zero, uh, then the conclusion is that A is cohomologically trivial. Okay. Um, then there's a little bit, there's more. If moreover, uh, it's, if it's Z-free, um, then it is actually projective. Okay. That's the first one. And then the second one is, sort of in the vein of a converse. Suppose that A is cohomologically trivial. Um, then, uh, yeah, so then all of its tape, it, yeah, this one is basically saying cohomologically trivial implies tape cohomologically trivial. So by definition of cohomologically trivial, we would have exactly this only without a hat, and therefore it would only be for non-negative um, uh, it would, in fact, only be for strictly positive uh, integers n. Uh, but if you take the Tate cohomology, then then we're asserting that you get both. Okay. So I want to prove this. Let me let me look, sneak a look ahead, and see. Yeah, it's going to take a little while too. So um, I think. Uh, I mean, I think I'm going. I think I'm finding myself in a situation where I want to. Um, I want to record the proof of this result, you know, to, to keep things going along. And so now's a good time. If you have, if you want to watch it now, you know, you can watch it and you can ask me questions, but you know, it's Friday afternoon. If you got to go, you know, even if you want to go, I totally, I totally understand. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to do the proof of the theorem that I said I wanted to prove. It's probably going to take 15 to 20 more minutes. Any, any questions before I do that? If anybody wants, you know, no problem at all. If you if you if you can't if you don't want to stick around for this, okay. So right, I'm trying to prove this this theorem uh, again. What was it? It was like if um, if consecutive Tate cohomology groups vanish on a, on all the CELO P subgroups. And then the module is cohomologically trivial. That's 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 most of it actually. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as for any module over any ring, the ring is non-commutative. That's fine. You can certainly write a module as a quotient of a free module, and then the kernel is whatever it is. Okay? We're going to see later in the proof that actually we 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 should be able to say more about what the proper. We we should be able to say some nice things about this kernel. In our situation, in general, we have no control over it. It's just some, it's just some module. Okay, but definitely we can make F to be a free module. Okay, so if I fix a prime, then I'm going to work prime by prime. So for a prime P, um, there's a, these are just I, I think I'm just writing down my hypothesis here. Okay, great. Seems helpful. Okay, um, 
so since f is free, I mean it's free. All the all the all the the best kind of ZG modules. So it's certainly induced. So it's certainly acyclic for tape cohomology. Um, so oops, that looks that looks like I oh no I'm, okay I'm getting confused. Yeah, so here I've already um, this is correct. I've elided, I've elided the details of it though. So here, what am I doing? Maybe in your mind, actually, actually take the long exact sequence in Tate cohomology here, right? And so what am I saying? I'm saying that all of the Tate cohomology groups of F are gonna go away. And I've told you that two consecutive Tate cohomology groups of A are going to go away. So that should tell us something about two more cohomology groups of R going away but which ones, right? So if you just kind of do it carefully, so um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's revisit starting in this exact sequence, if I can just say it. So I start at the Qth Tate cohomology of A, that's zero. That it, so that zero injects into R, injects into the something Tate cohomology of this thing where all of them is zero. So uh, that proves that the Q plus first Tate cohomology of R is equal to zero. And then similarly, you go one more and you get the figure. So I, this, this is just, you, you write out the long exact sequence in tape cohomology and the fact that these two vanish for A and all of them vanish for F should tell you that two of them vanish for R. Okay, and that's what we get. Any questions about that? I mean, if, I, if I'd written it out, it would be straightforward. So I hope I, I, hope I, I didn't screw it up. Okay. Let's see, so F is ZG free. So it's Z free, okay, it's because ZG is, anyway, taking H equals one in what Hayan proved, it's a, it's, if, if it's a free ZG module, it's a free ZH module with H equals one. So it's a free Z module. It's also kind of clear that ZG is a free Z module. And Z is a wonderful ring, Z is a PID. So submodules of free Z modules are always free. Don't try that with an arbitrary ring, but it's true here. So R is Z free, hence, uh, yeah, so by the way, it's Z, it's, uh, it's Z flat, okay, free implies flat. And then the thing that we're using here and even a little bit later, I think maybe Harari kind of assumes that you know this, um, for modules over a PID, flat and torsion free are the same. Okay. This, is, this is a result, this is proved in my community of algebra uh, notes in, in particular. So, um, and so torsion free, buys you that flat. So in other words, if I, if I take a torsion-free Z module and then I have an exact sequence of Z modules and then I tensor with my torsion-free Z module, it'll still be exact. That's the, that's the community of algebra fact that we're using here. Okay, well, we will use. Okay, so R is Z-free, so it's torsion-free. So multiplication by P is injective. Okay, right, we're using, using it that way. And so therefore I have a short exact sequence. The only, only non-trivial part is that, is that this was injective because it's torsion free. Okay. Um, right, let's see. Then you take your Tate cohomology of this exact sequence, use these two vanishing cohomology groups, and that's gonna give you that this guy is gonna be trapped between some vanishing Tate cohomology groups. So that one's gonna be, this one's going to be vanishing. Okay, so we're just so far we're just using the long exact sequence in tape cohomology, but now we say, oh boy, this is exactly a situation where we can apply the theorem that we just proved, because while well, I passed to a Celo P subgroup, so for sure it's a finite P group. I don't have to remember very much. I can, I can visibly see that R mod PR is a P torsion group. Okay, so that's an FP of G module. And so by, by exactly what we just proved, that's a typo, R mod PR is even a free FP of G module. So it's certainly an induced, induced uh, ZGP module. Okay, so the previous theorem comes in. That was the end of step one. Okay, so this, this R mod PR guy is, um, is, uh, is, in, is induced over this CELO P subgroup. Step two. Now I'm kind of going to bootstrap it a bit. So I'm going to assume that A is actually a free Z module. 
um, which I'm not assuming is true in general, but then I can reduce to this case later. So, okay, so now I'm going to assume that A is Z free. I'm going to take define M to be the hom from A into R. Okay, and my claim is that H1 of GM equals zero. This looks sort of familiar from what we just did. Um, okay, so A is Z free, hence it's Z projective. And then for modules before I had like a hom blank M and that being exact was equivalent to injectivity. Now I have a hom M blank, that being exact is equivalent to projectivity. So I have a free module, so it's projective. So hom, hom A blank is, um, um, uh, is, a, is an exact functor. Okay. And so if I apply my exact functor to this short exact sequence, well, what am I doing? I'm just taking hom A into R, which by definition is M, and this is M, and then I'm taking hom A into, okay, so I just, I just applied it. And I look at this exact sequence, well, what is it telling me? It's telling me that, um, you know, the guy in the middle modulo the, the image is, is modulo the kernel is equal to the, to the image. So, okay, so M modulo um, PM is isomorphic to hom A PR, Okay. And then again, what we proved before is that if you have an induced module, then hom from anything into, let's, let's, let's back up. Um, yeah. If you have an induced module, then hom from anything into your induced module is also induced. Good, we're using it. So now we get that M mod PM is an induced GP module. Okay, we're working, we're, 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 we're doing stuff. All right, let's, let's keep going. Um, since R is, is uh, Z, Z torsion free, we just talked, we, we talked about that. Um, R was even Z free. So is hom into it. So you stop and think hom into a torsion free module is going to be torsion free. And so again, I can do this uh, multiplication by P is going to be um, is going to be an injection. All right. And so where am I going with this? Now I take my Tate, uh, I take my Tate cohomology. All right. And so let's see, what's the point? What did I just say? I just said that M mod PM was induced as a GP module. So totally acyclic for Tate cohomology of GP. So, okay. So there's a Tate cohomology group that must be zero. I keep doing the Tate, the Tate exact sequence. And so what did I learn from doing this? I learned that the kernel of multiplication by P on this cohomology group was this guy, which is zero. So therefore H1 GP has no P torsion. And as a very basic fact about um, torsion commutative groups, if you have no P torsion, you have no P power torsion. If I had an element of order P to the 17, if I multiplied it by P to the 16, I'd get an element of exact order P. So that's, that's the least of our worries. Okay, so by the previous, by a previous lemma, this is the um, restriction to CELA subgroups being injective thing. We know that the P primary torsion, right? So we, we want to we want to go back from the CELA subgroups of the whole group, and that, that's easy, actually. We do this. So we get into this, and we just said that this one is equal to zero, and we have an injection into zero. And so therefore H1 GM P infinity is equal to zero. But again, G was some finite group, and so H1 and GM a priori was some group, um, some torsion group that was that was only you know, um, whose exponent is only divisible by primes dividing G, and that's true for every prime. So sure, we prove that H1 GM is equal to zero. Okay, M being hom A into R. Okay, so yeah, this 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 goes goes for a little while. So now we're about to get the, the result under the assumption that A is Z free. Okay. So again, um, if it's Z free, then it's Z projective. And so what did I do here? Here, I, again, I'm, I'm using that hom A blank is exact because A is projective. And I just took the 
R into F into A to zero, the very first exact sequence that I wrote down and I applied the HOM to it, I got another exact sequence, okay. Then I take the cohomology of that exact sequence and, you know, this, so again, this is sort of similar. So this is the G invariants here are the G, G homomorphisms, the G invariants here are the G homomorphisms. The next term would be H1 uh, GM, but okay, we just proved that that was zero. So yeah, this, this is reminiscent of the, of, the, of the previous one. And so now I know that the map from G equivariant home maps from A to F surjects onto the G equivariant maps from A to A, okay? And so um, what does that mean? Uh, in particular, I have the identity map between A to A, that's certainly a G invariant map. And that identity map must lift here because it's, because it's surjective, okay? And again, what, is, what does that really mean? Um, that really, so the lifting of the identity map precisely means there's some G map from A to F so that what is, what is this map here? This map here is, is um, um, pulling back from A to F. So that's, um, wait, uh, no, wrong. This map is, hum, is composing with the map from F into A. Yeah, so A is a portion of F. Okay, so I take my map from A into F and I compose it with the map that I didn't give a name to from F into A. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. So therefore, this identity map on A factors through this map iota. And then you say, all right, you're making kind of a meal of this maybe, but, but this means that you have a section of, um, of, this, of this, uh, this map from F down to A. This iota is exactly what you need in order for the short exact sequence that we started with to be split. This iota is defining a splitting of the short exact sequence. Right, what does it mean for a short exact sequence to be split? Um, I need a section from A to F, so I need a map from A to F, so that when I compose it back, I get the identity on A, that's exactly what I need. Yeah. So therefore this sequence splits. Well, that's wonderful. That tells me that A and R are both projective. Okay, right. And so, yeah, so the main thing that I was trying to prove in part A, oh boy. The main thing that I was trying to prove in part A was that A is cohomologically trivial. If moreover, A is Z-free, then it's projective. Great, I just proved that. Okay, so I proved the moreover part and certainly projective implies induced, implies cohomologically trivial. Okay, so I, I did the moreover and now to complete the proof of part A, I just have to drop the assumption that A is Z-free. And you, it's, why is that so easy? Well, here's why because we, are, we have this R guy too. And we definitely mentioned that R just, R is certainly Z-free being a submodule of, of a free ZG module. And so therefore we can apply step two to R. And that tells me that, that R is projective and therefore induced and therefore cohomologically trivial. And now you come back to this basic exact sequence and you say, oh, it's wonderful. F is free, hence projective, hence cohomologically trivial. If R is also projective, hence cohomologically trivial, if I take, you know, if I have a short exact sequence of modules and two of them are cohomologically trivial, well, the third one has to be cohomologically trivial because if you do the long exact sequence and take cohomology, two out of every three of the groups are gonna be zero, so the third one is gonna be zero. Okay, so that does indeed show that A is cohomologically trivial, so that completes the proof of part A. And then there was, okay, it, 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 I don't think it's, yeah, we're, we're actually almost done. So what about part B was a converse, if your part B was like, if you're cohomologically trivial, then your Tate cohomologically trivial. Okay, so suppose that A is cohomologically trivial. So I claim that we can plug in the proof that we made for part A, for part A, the hypothesis was that um, there should be some index, 
sorry, that's, that's two consecutive indices that when you restrict to the, wow, CELO subgroups for those indices, then you get zero. But if A is cohomologically trivial, this is true for lots of Q. This is certainly true for Q equals one. Cohomologically trivial means all the cohomology, all the higher cohomology of all the subgroups of A is equal to zero. So if A is cohomologically trivial, this is certainly true for Q equals one. It's also true, it's true for all positive integers Q. Okay. All, the, all the higher cohomology groups of A for any subgroup whatsoever is equal to zero. So if only I'm if I'm only assuming that A is cohomologically trivial, then the hypothesis of part A applies. I don't want the conclusion of part A because the conclusion is that it's cohomologically trivial. I'm assuming that. However, in the argument, I actually established more. I established that in this, in this very basic sequence, I proved that R was projective as well. Right. And so therefore. I'm in exactly that situation. If I just assume that um, that A is cohomologically trivial, I run the argument back of, of step one, and I get that R is uh, projective. And then, well, I say the exact same thing that I did that I did before. And so, so therefore, um, right. So therefore, R is going to be. Um, Right back to make sure that we're seeing what's happening here. Uh, yeah, just maybe just to be clear, R A and R are pro, are Z G projective, right? Not for CELO subgroups or anything else. Z Z G projective. Okay, um, and then we win, in fact, because again, if um, if R and F are Z G projective, then um, uh, then we we use the thing that Hayang just proved. If they're if they're ZG projective, then they're ZH projective for all subgroups H of G, and therefore for all subgroups H, they're induced, and therefore they're totally acyclic for Tate cohomology. So all of these higher cohom Tate cohomology groups, not all, the, not higher, all of the Tate cohomology groups uh, of H for both R and F are zero. And again, we have this short exact sequence. Um, zero goes to R, goes to F, goes to A, goes to zero. And same, same thing, right? Now, if I take the long Tate cohomology uh, sequence uh, applied to H, then every two out of three of these guys are equal to zero. So the third one is equal to zero as well. And therefore, we've proved pretty easily based on everything else that if A was cohomologically trivial, then it is Tate cohomologically trivial as well. Okay, yeah, so that's it. And then um, there's a couple more, the, the honest, so the next thing I'm gonna do, I'll, I'll end the lecture here. The next thing I think, I think I have on Monday's lecture, I should be able to, I hope I haven't written it, written it out yet. Um, I should be able to tell you what a cup product is in terms of homogeneous cochains tell you some formal properties of cup products, and then um, at least like state the, state the results that lead up to the um, Tate Nakayama uh, lemma. The, the, the proofs of these last few results are less interesting and kind of more technical and straightforward than the ones that we already saw. So these were kind of the best theorems and proofs um, in the chapter, but in, by the, in the next lecture, we'll do cup products, plug everything in and, and, and um, state the Tate Nakayama lemma. Then we're off on Wednesday, right? And then the following week, we'll come back and we'll do profinite groups and Galois cohomology. Okay, well, we're, we're moving. So, all right, thanks for your attention, for everybody who stuck around. Uh, as I Let me remind myself to um, record, um, chop off the, anyway, you know, upload, upload the lecture and I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye.